May 12th, Johnston establishes a defensive position around the invaluable Western Atlantic Railroad at the Ustinala River in anticipation of a Union attack. Johnston, as I anticipated, had abandoned all his well-prepared defenses at Dalton and was found inside of Resaca with the bulk of his army, holding his divisions well in hand, acting purely on the defensive, and fighting well at all points of conflict. Risaka will become a war zone. May 14th, the Battle of Risaka begins as nearly 100,000 Union troops pour out of Snake Creek Gap and head east towards the small town. The fighting breaks out to the north of Risaka and continues into the next day. Corporal Joseph W. Gatskill, Company B of the 104th Ohio Volunteer Infantry is at Risaka. Pride and a personal sense of duty and honor sustain as the bugle sounds the charge and all go forward with lusty yells. The screaming of shot and shell seeming to infuse one with a strong desire to reach the harmless end of firearms that are dealing out death in the ranks. Sherman seeks to block the Confederates' avenue of retreat by crossing the Ustanala River. Meanwhile, Sherman sends General Gerard and his cavalry down the Ustanala to, if possible, interrupt the railroad between Calhoun and Kingston to the southwest of Risaka. On the 15th, McPherson and his men gain the higher ground, a ridge overlooking the town. It allows his artillery to inflict damage to the Ustinala Railroad Bridge. When General Johnston learns of this, he exercises the better part of valor. Upon this, the idea of fighting north of the Ustinala was abandoned at once, and the orders to Lieutenant General Hood were countermanded. Stewart's division did not receive the countermand from Corps headquarters in time to prevent its execution of the previous order and engaging the enemy and of course it suffered before being recalled. The danger that threatened our line of communications made me regard the continued occupation of Risaka as too hazardous. His forces leave Risaka, setting fire to the bridges behind him to slow Union pursuit. He had little choice when faced with overwhelming numbers. A pursuit begins with Sherman's forces hot on the heels of Johnston's. On the 17th, a division of Thomas's Army of the Cumberland makes contact with the rear guard of the Confederate Army. Artillery is exchanged. By the next morning, the Confederate forces have again moved on. Johnston places his army between the towns of Kingston and Cassville, southwest of Versailles. After a brief skirmish with Thomas's forces, Johnston's men retreat into Cassville where they establish a secure line and await the oncoming Union Army. It is May 19th. General Sherman. The stout resistance made by the enemy along our whole front of a couple of miles indicated a purpose to fight at Cassville. And as the night was closing in, General Thomas and I were together along with our skirmish lines near the seminary on the edge of town. Where musket bullets from the enemy were cutting the leaves of the trees pretty thickly about us. Johnston is shocked when unexpected Union cavalrymen approach his unit from the right. The appearance of artillery firing at the center of the line leads Johnston to make a tough call, one that puts him in direct conflict with General Hood one he will admittedly regret in later years, General Hood. An army fighting and retreating at the same time, taking up positions day after day, to be given up only under cover of darkness, suffers great loss. Let this policy be continued for a distance of 100 miles, and the pride, pomp, and circumstance of glorious war are lost in a somewhat funereal procession. The next morning, like before, Johnston and his men quietly retreat from Cassville for the security 
of the Alatuna Mountains. His men are ragged and even worse, demoralized. Captain Henry Richards of Company F, 93rd Ohio. Our men look haggard and worn out. We have full rations of pork, hard bread, sugar, and coffee, nothing else. We have no clothing, tents, nor baggage, nothing but what we carry. As we are obliged to carry three days rations on our person, it makes a good load for hot weather. Though the nights are cold. Sherman, meanwhile, knows the strategic advantages to be had by the Confederates in the Alatoona and opts to move around Johnston's left flank. The forces do clash at a small church known as the New Hope Church. This is where Johnston's army, anticipating Sherman's maneuver, stands ready. Johnston shrewdly prepares the ambush, knowing that Sherman would avoid Alatoona altogether. Hood and his army march into New Hope on the 24th and take position behind the frontal defenses and to the right. One brigade even uses church tombstones as cover. It is 5 p.m. on May 25th when Union soldiers arrive. At the head of Sherman's forces are General Joseph Hooker's 20th Corps, broken up into three divisions, each on separate roads. Sherman sees the line as a small one and orders Hooker to attack. He underestimates the strength of Johnson's forces and it becomes a bloodbath. General Sherman. The woods were so dense and the resistance so spirited that Hooker could not carry the position, for the battle was noisy and prolonged far into the night. At this point, New Hope, was the accidental intersection of the road leading from Altoona to Dallas, with that from Van Wert to Marietta. It was four miles northeast of Dallas, and from the bloody fighting there for the next week, was given a nickname by the soldiers. This hellhole is an unforgiving and wide ravine that Hooker's men must scramble down, making them sitting ducks for the Confederate forces on the other side. It also makes it difficult for Hooker to coordinate as they are buffeted by shrapnel from one of 16 Confederate cannons. Union General Williams. They poured canister and shrapnel into us from all directions, except the rear. The fighting lasts two hours. The Confederates lose around 400 of a 4,000 man division, while the Union Army of 16,000 suffers losses and casualties totaling 1,665. Skirmishing continues throughout the next day. The Battle of New Hope Church is only the start of bloodier fighting to come. After the losses at New Hope, Sherman attempts to outflank Johnston's forces established at Pickett's Mill at 5 p.m. on May 27th. The Union soldiers must traverse thick brush and undergrowth with the hope of reforming on the other side. Amongst those is journalist Ambrose Bierce, a first lieutenant and topographical officer. The air was sibilant with streams and sheets of missiles. In the steady, unvarying roar of small arms, the frequent shock of the cannon was rather felt than heard. But the gusts of grape which they blew into that populous wood were audible enough, screaming among the trees and cracking against their stems and branches. General Claiborne's 10,000 troops are punished by the Confederate forces, who inflict losses of nearly 1,600 against the 500 rebel soldiers lost. No command to fall back was given. None could have been heard. Man by man, the survivors withdrew at will, sifting through the trees into the cover of the ravines, among the wounded who could drag themselves back. 
Determined to guard the railroad, Johnston plants his men along Brushy Mountain to Lost Mountain, roughly eight miles west of Marietta on June 4th. The line is built to defend Atlanta, but at 10 miles proves too long for Johnston's limited forces to defend. On the 18th, an advance by Sherman that captures Alatoona Pass forces Johnston to reform the line at Kennesaw Mountain. Known as the Gibraltar of Georgia, it is here the fighting will intensify. Back in Washington, D.C., new fissures and divisions open within the Union. The Democratic Party has split into two over peace and war. The Peace Democrats elect George B. McClellan for their anti-war platform, as on June 8th, President Abraham Lincoln is nominated for the Republican ticket. It will be a tight race, with Lincoln's victory or failure hinging on the success or failure of General Sherman, who has already faced two defeats within three days. The rain is unrelenting, falling in sheets on both armies, making an advance even more difficult for Sherman and his men. For 11 long days, General Sherman. In action and on the march, rain is favorable. But in the woods, where all is blind and uncertain, it seems almost impossible for an army covering 10 miles of front to act in concert during wet and stormy weather. Johnston and his men lay in wait along the long, defensible ridge of Kennesaw Mountain. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.